Hello and a warm welcome to Talking Stocks. I'm Kukule Tukzele. In studio with me is Peter Armitage and Brian Rudd, both from Anchor Capital. Now today we're talking the NASDAQ OMX Group, an American multinational financial services corporation that owns and operates the NASDAQ stock market and eight European stock exchanges. It is headquartered in New York City and its president and chief executive officer is Robert Greenfield. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, guys. Maybe when we go back uh, to the NASDAQ, we probably have to take two steps back despite the introduction that I've made because sometimes we think we're referring to the market or is it an index tracker? Uh, what is it exactly? Well, that's it. You know, similar to we have the JSC in South Africa, the NASDAQ is pretty much the technology exchange in the US. So it is the actual physical board where people go and list on. They provide the service for listing as well as then obviously offering the the index tracker or the equivalent of the JC All Share. Mm. What actually makes up the particular stocks in this particular tracker? Well, is it sector specific or? Well, it's one of those that's, it's always originally been the tech sector. Um, that's where the boom came in the, the late 90s. But more of more recently, they've, they've tried to move away from that, trying to entice other stocks to come onto it. Um, but I would say predominantly at this stage, it's still a tech index. Mm. Would that be a bit uh, risky though, Peter, given the fact that everybody knows what happened with the uh, uh, tech bubble? No, I think that's the whole point with the NASDAQ, is when you, when you <coughs> see it as a share, um, the natural assumption, as you were saying, is that it's basically the NASDAQ index that we see. Mm. But that, in fact, is a relatively small part of its business, and they've expanded well beyond that into providing services, um, both from a technology and platform perspective, um, as well as kind of data, information, that type of thing, and, and providing uh, trackers and things that people can invest in. So it's, it's a well-diversified financial services company rather than just an index. And I think the people, you intuitively would think that the earnings from the NASDAQ are related to the performance of the NASDAQ. It's, mm. it's almost completely unrelated. Um, it's about the volumes that are traded in that segment of it, but about 75%, as we'll see in some slides that come up later, about 75% of the revenue is recurring. Hmm. Um, so it's in fact much more of an annuity business, which we like, and annuity businesses tend to attract higher ratings, and, and we see as quite valuable. Um, it's much more of an annuity business than w one would think. If we can flesh out slightly more in the operations though. Well, it's the one thing I'd just like to add on as well is we, we always have a tendency to forget about the OMX portion of this business. Yeah which has helped this business very much to diversify away from US tech specific. It controls pretty much the Nordic region stock exchanges as well, and that covers pretty much every sector, every listing. So it's, it does have a very diverse stream. And then as Peter's alluded to, there's services such as clearing, um, platform services, um, listing information, actual data on the shares that are trading. So it's very much a diversified base that's coming through there now. Mm. On that though, if we can run through just a couple of the stats, you mentioned that there's several countries that they operate in, uh, market cap is also quite impressive. Well that's it, you know, you look at this business and they power 70 stock exchanges around the world with their technology. So they have s developed the exchange technology and then they've sold it on to other countries to actually run their stock exchanges. So they've got 70 exchanges in 50 different countries. Um, if we look at the NASDAQ alone, sitting in the US in isolation, there's three and a half thousand listed companies on that. Um, so we're looking at multiples of what the JSC has locally. A total market value of 9.1 trillion US dollars. Um, it's it's mind-boggling numbers when you start looking at these businesses mm. and how big some of them actually are. So I think it's a it's a very well positioned and and the one stat that I quite like is one out of every ten transactions done on stock markets around the world is done on NASDAQ. So you have the big tech stocks around the world, your yeah. Apples, your Googles, um, that are available on this exchange and everybody buys them regardless of where you are. So one out of every global transaction happens on NASDAQ. I'm happy you said that because it almost sounds like a futuristic company. <laughs> We've done Apple before and uh, also been a game changer in that particular sphere. I is this one, like you say, that uh, uh, is a company maybe designed for the future? You need to understand the long-term uh, objectives here and the exponential growth potential. Well, it's one of those that, you know, you've got a business that allows m other companies to come to market, to raise capital, to trade freely in the secondary market. Are they changing the world? Probably not as much as we would like them to. Um, you know, it is a, a one concern around this business is they have had platform glitches, um, specifically to the NASDAQ exclusively. So they, they're in the process of en enhancing their technology and, and really updating it and bringing it 
to a new age to, to reflect the companies that list on it. Um, but they're a little bit slow in that process at the moment. On the metric side of things though, uh, looking at the price earnings ratio, does it uh, look fairly expensive when you compare it to its peers? When you compare it to its peers, no. Um, it's, I think, fairly valued compared to its peers. We'll see just a little bit later on one of the slides that it is a little bit expensive relative to its long-term history at the moment. But I think you've got a, a fantastic business that's giving you good compound growth over time mm -hmm. and currently trading on a Ford 15 multiple, um, which is roughly in line with the JC if we're going to compare, if it can't carry on the comparison. So I think we've got a fair value, um, as I say, in line with this long-term average uh, on a Ford basis, a little bit expensive on the currently. Mm. Why do you like it though, Peter, if you do at all? So we do, yeah. So, so exchanges are great businesses. Um, obviously, you want to make sure that they're keeping market share. But effectively, they've got 3,500 companies listed, as, as we talked about. And those are basically annuity revenue forever. Mm. You know, there's fees and everything that's traded in those companies, they get fees and volume fees off, uh, for, the, for the rest of time. Now, the secret is, so you've kind of got almost a toll gate. And you're just taking a tick of each transaction that's going through. 45% mm. operating margin, so it's going to generate cash. And so you've got a fantastic base. And then it becomes about, is management good enough to grow it, either through new products? And one of the interesting new products they've got is a, is a, futures, uh, a, a futures exchange on energy. You know, so it's new innovations, it's, it's new products coming through. And then obviously, if you've got that margin, um, it's generating a lot of cash and they can go and do acquisitions to add to it. So the, the European acquisitions that they did um, over the last few years have added quite a lot to the business. Mm. So it makes for a mix of a hell of an hour space, generating cash, lots of annuity, and, and exchanges are monopolies in a sense. Mm. So, I mean, the JSC is a true monopoly. There's nobody competing with it, although there will be some new competitors over the course of the next six months. But, you know, the NASDAQ owns its space. It's got about 20% market share. Um, and its job is really to try and convince new companies to come into the NASDAQ as opposed to the other bigger exchanges in the US and its other exchanges around the world. Maybe if we look at the revenue split uh, and in particular, as you say, trying to approach new markets and get uh, new parties onto uh, this particular exchange, uh, uh, is there significant opportunities there for it to expand its revenue base? Very much so. If you, if you actually go and look at the, the first half of their earnings um, on the US IPO, they had a 68% win rate. Um, so they are pretty much one of the preferred exchanges to list on. So they've got, they are attracting the new listings. Um, they've also recently acquired a company called Dorsey Wright, um, which does ETFs. And they've acquired the business and listed all those ETFs onto the business, in turn generating more revenue through the volumes that go through. Um, so there's definitely ways in which this company can grow its revenue base. Mm -hmm. I don't expect it to grow at 30, 40%. That's not for sure. Um, we do expect a more moderate growth on the top line. So 5 to 10% on the top line. But again, good cost controls. You've got a pretty much a fixed base. Once you have the systems in place, once you have the, the people in place, the additional revenue drops all the way down to the bottom line. So earnings growth then goes to about 10% on a compound basis. So I think there's great opportunities for this business. Do you think that's sustainable, though, the uh, earnings growth at 10%? Very much so. You know, it, well... Let me take one step back. You know, we've already al alluded to this being a volume-based business. So they generate their income based on the volume that trades. So through, even if volume stays the same, when markets go up, they're kind of getting the same thing. People, markets go down, people want to sell, volumes are still there. Mm. So your volumes are there pretty much most of the time. So there's going to be slight variation in that, but that's only 25% of the revenue split, or that's what they're dependent on. So when you can go around and you can sell data to people, when you can go and attract listings, as those listings grow, the fees, the, the annuity and revenue that comes from that grows as well. Mm. So I definitely think it, it, it is a sustainable. 25% um, is very much market dependent though. So, but based on the current assumptions, we're quite happy with that forecast. Speaking of the, of the market though, uh, does this often, uh, the, the share price or uh, the investment case for this particular stock always rely and maybe track the markets? You mentioned that, what, 17 times PE, uh, does it seem expensive and also fluctuate according to uh, the market environment at the moment? So I think, as we were saying, that's kind of the perception that it's linked to the market, mm. but only a small portion is. So I think the, the mix is quite nice. So if you've got 75% you that's annuity revenue, you've got 25% that's more market linked, I quite like that mix. Because the market goes up over time, there's going to be times when you get some nice leverage out of it. Um, so your margin will increase when the market's going up. But if the market takes, a, yeah, if the market has a big um, plummet, you know, it's probably going to impact its turnover by 5 or 10% if anything. In fact, as Brian was saying, 
when the market comes off, volumes often double, you know, because there's so much trade going on. Mm -hmm. So the market going down, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a much more stable business um, than, than one might perceive. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt. That's the one thing with this business is the, the recent volatility we've actually seen has been beneficial for the business because people are buying and selling based on latest news and speculation and the whole thing of, you know, buy the rumor, sell the fact. Mm. So the, the bit of volatility in the market actually does contribute and, and give the company that little bit extra. Well, let's find out from our experts now if this is a particular stock that you need to buy, hold or sell. Peter, buy, hold or sell? Yeah, so in our anchor capital model portfolio, we've had this for quite some time. Um, it's a share that's likely to ret retain its place and be a long-term hold in our business. Um, so if you've got a reasonable, you know, we always invest on a, invest on a two, three, four year horizon. And on that basis, we definitely call it a buy. Mm. I take it you agree then, Barry? Very much so. You know, I think it's a, it's a great business, it's a solid business. As you say, it's, it's not going to necessarily shoot the lights out like some of the other tech businesses, but mm -hmm. very stable long-term great business, um, so not without its risks, but we think that there's, there's enough in the business to mitigate a lot of those. And I take it the best way to get exposure to this particular stock is what, through a fund that maybe uh, Anchor Capital or its peers might well, have? Well, we run segregated portfolios, so you can directly own it. Very easy to do. Yes. Uh, cheaper that way too, maybe. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, that's why we do it. <laughs> Indeed. Well, we'll leave it there for today. Uh, a big thank you to both my guests, Peter Armitage and uh, Brian Rudd from Anchor Capital, giving us a buy recommendation on NASDAQ OMX. I'm afraid that's where we have to leave it for this week. Do catch us again next time where we talk more stocks. For the latest fundamental and technical analysis delivered right to your inbox, log on to talkingstocks.co.za and sign up for the Talking Stocks newsletter.